Okay, Dr. David Shaw is FAA Regional Flight Surgeon for the Great Lakes Region and is a retired Air Force Colonel, Chief Flight Surgeon for almost 40 years experiencing helping aviators. He is uh, boarded in aerospace and preventative medicine as well as a otolaryngology head and neck. I got close with that. We were Surge. practicing and practicing. We practice, yeah. we yeah. practice. There's just some things a tongue won't it's do. It's E&T. Okay, here's another one. <laughs> Uh, additional fellowship training in uh, neurotology. He also uh, has over 1,600 hours as a flight surgeon in over 42 types of aircraft. I give you Mr. David Shaw. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're looking to hear the briefing on how to fly to Canada, this is not it, okay? So we'll be talking about uh, over-the-counter medications and how they can kind of mess up your life if you uh, are not aware of some of those uh, adverse side effects. We live in the age of do-it-yourself, so how many of you have Googled your symptoms to find out what kind of condition you have? And in fact, a lot of <coughs> our public health departments use that to track flu statistics and how many people Google their symptoms, and we can see it correlates very quickly with the flu epidemic that is passing through that area. So Google is tracking you and watching you and wanting to know what kind of symptoms you're having. But as uh, you see here, the mechanic uh, doing it himself, changing the plugs on the fly. Uh, so you can do anything. You can be a skull base surgeon if you want to. We're all familiar with the I'm safe checklist. Okay, so before you go fly, you should run through this. Do I have any illnesses or sicknesses? Am I taking any medications? Do I have any stress going on right now in my life? Uh, if you're in the middle of a big divorce or bankruptcy or you've got a lot of stuff on your mind, it may affect your ability to follow a checklist. Uh, obviously, alcohol goes without saying. Fatigue, we are the worst at estimating how tired we are. And so when we do testing, neurocognitive testing in people and assess them for their fatigue, uh, they always overestimate how rested they are. And uh, so that's a big area right now, especially with sleep apnea. It's a special emphasis area with the FAA. And then finally, making sure that you're uh, eating something. It's kind of hard to pull over in the middle of the air. You don't have flight attendants in most GA aircraft. So uh, make sure that you have something to eat or that you're uh, well fed before you go. Any basic med people out there? Okay, so I, I went and did my basic med exam with my uh, doctor, and my doctor and I get to decide what the standards are for me to go fly. And he has to review my medications to make sure that I can do safety-sensitive duties as pilot in command. Well, that's kind of a big step of faith because my internist has absolutely no training in aerospace medicine, nor, nor is he a medical review officer and familiar with drugs being used in safety sensitive duties. Our air traffic controllers who control throughout our eight state region have to call us before they take any medication, whether it's over the counter, prescription, herbal, et cetera. It has to be cleared with us. And so we review those medications and make sure that they're okay for them to perform duties. And sometimes it isn't the medication, it's the condition that they're taking the medication for. So this is my little basic med form that I got after doing a 30-minute PowerPoint review uh, done by AOPA, and uh, now I'm really smart in aerospace medicine. And as part of the basic med, you also agree to CFR 6153 that basically says if you have some kind of condition that would make it unacceptable for you to be pilot in command, or you're taking medications that may interfere with your ability to be pilot in command, you should not perform those duties. I love these quotes. It takes an airplane to uh, bring out the worst in a pilot, and there's no level of skill so high that it cannot be overcome by poor judgment. Okay. That's AOPA, Bruce Landberg, quote. So we're going to not talk too much about prescription drugs. We'll do a little bit, but mostly over-the-counter drugs and some herbal stuff. And this is a big business. Uh, there are generic names and trade names. So the trade name is Tylenol, 
the generic name is acetaminophen. And the same thing with Benadryl. Benadryl is also known as diphenhydramine. Big business, okay? Over 300,000 over-the-counter drugs are available in the United States. So when you go into your Walmart or wherever you shop, CVS, there are aisles and aisles and aisles of over-the-counter drugs that you have to choose from. And it's a lot of money. On the average, we make 26 trips a year buying over-the-counter drugs. 81% of adults use over-the-counter drugs. How many of you have used over-the-counter drugs? Okay, just about everybody. So herbals are another big area. And many patients forget to tell their doctors that they're taking herbal supplements. Now the challenge with herbals is you kind of don't know what you're getting and you don't know that the potency is going to be the same each time. And oh, by the way, occasionally there's contaminants that are in those herbal or over-the-counter medications that are manufactured. Many of the drugs that come out of China, for example, we get notifications that there are other drugs that have been added accidentally, drugs like Viagra, et cetera, that are in these herbals that you're taking and you think that this pure ginkgo Below, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Uh, it's not doing what it used to do, or I'm having some symptoms that are kind of weird that I don't know where that's coming from. So just be aware. <clears throat> they're called botanicals or phytotherapy, and they're sold as tablets, capsules, powders, teas, extracts, etc. And as I mentioned, they're labeled natural, so they should be good. You shouldn't have any problems with them. They're pure, they're 100% pure by whose estimation? Well, by the label, it says so, so it must be true, right? So you should Google that. But uh, <clears throat> herbal medicines don't have to go through the testing. They're not FDA approved. And so some of those drugs, such as Compe or Ephedra, can have some serious side effects in people who are on various medications or have cardiac conditions, et cetera. So you really want to make sure. And furthermore, they can interact with many of the drugs that you're taking by prescription. These are some of the common uh, supplements. <coughs> so garlic, how dangerous can garlic be? Garlic is healthy for you, right? Well, we'll see. Saw pimento, a lot of folks take that. Uh, Gingson. And here's what some of these herbals do. You have enzymes in your liver, and these enzymes can either be upregulated, induced, or they can be downregulated and as such, be an inhibitor. Those enzymes are very critical for metabolizing some of the drugs. So if that enzyme is ramped up, that drug is going to be chewed up a lot quicker, and you're going to get lower doses in your bloodstream. It's not going to be as effective. Contrarily, if it is uh, an inhibitor, then you're going to get toxic levels of those drugs build up. So if it's an inhibitor or inducer, you need to know that. And some of those drugs that you're taking may use those very same enzymes for their metabolism. So let's look at how these interactions may occur. Well, first of all, you can have drug-drug interactions, OK? So this is where you may be taking warfarin and aspirin. Warfarin's a blood thinner. And both of those things have effects on the platelets. And so now you're going to have a lot more bleeding events because you're compounding the effect. That's a drug-drug interaction. If you take antacids, but you're on digitoxin, a heart pill, okay, the antacids will reduce your ability to absorb those, and so you'll get lower levels, and you won't get the effect on your heart that you think you're getting, and your doctor's going to think the drug didn't work when you forgot to tell them you were taking antacids for heartburn. Duplication. This gets people into trouble with drugs that have Tylenol, okay? Tylenol is everywhere, acetaminophen, and you need to read the label. So if you're taking Tylenol for a knee pain, but you also have a cold and you're taking over-the-counter cold medicines, now you're starting to double the dose of Tylenol that you're taking. And the bandwidth, the safety for Tylenol and liver toxicity is pretty low, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Opposition or antagonism, okay? So now <coughs> your NSAIDs, your non-steroidal drugs like Motrin, et cetera, 
those cause you to retain sodium. And you're taking a diuretic that's trying to get rid of the sodium. So now you've got these two drugs that are fighting against each other. One is trying to say, save the sodium. The other is saying, try to get rid of it. And depending on the dose that you're taking will depend on which one is going to win. But neither one is going to be as effective. Alterations. Okay, so now this is affecting how the drug is either absorbed, metabolized, or excreted. So again, if you're taking acid blo blocking drugs uh, that are proton pump inhibitors, for example, that decrease the pH of the stomach, you're going to decrease the absorption of some of the uh, drugs that you're taking, like this antifungal called ketoconazole. Barbiturates, any type of phenobarbital type drug, those induce the liver enzymes. So if you're taking a blood thinner, your warfarin levels are going to drop a lot quicker, and your, your INRs, your blood tests, are not going to be effective. And you could have a clot that you throw to the brain because you didn't realize that these two drugs had this effect, and your warfarin wasn't protecting you. Other drugs like erythromycin or ciprofloxin can inhibit enzymes and, again, cause warfarin levels to increase now. And so now you're going to have risk for bleeding uh, accidents. And then even smoking can increase some of your liver enzymes. And so if you uh, are a smoker and you also have asthma, bad combination, not recommended, but uh, it can affect your levels of theophylline, which you take to treat the asthma. Drug-drug interaction. So now here's a drug used to treat one condition, but it makes another condition worse. Okay. So if you're taking a beta blocker like propanolol, for example, for heart disease, but you have asthma, it will worsen your asthma. And the same thing for diabetics. If you're taking a beta blocker, it's not going to help you recognize the low blood sugar symptoms where you start to get the sweat and feeling terrible. The beta blockers will block all those symptoms, and you won't know until your blood sugar bottoms out and you're unconscious. Not a good thing. <clears throat> You have diabetes, hypertensive ulcer disease, or glaucoma, any of these kind of stuff. These tend to have a fair amount of drug disease or interaction as well. Foods, okay? Who'd have thought that your food that you eat might interfere with your drugs that you're on? Grapefruits, classic with statin drugs, okay? They affect the enzymes in the uh, liver, and if you're taking statin drugs, this will increase your statin level, and you'll start having side effect symptoms. So the myopathies, the difficult, the muscle weakness, et cetera, may be worsened by eating grapefruits every day. Tyramine-rich foods. If you're on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and those are drugs that we use for depression or Parkinson's disease, and you have some of that fine Wisconsin smoked cheese, okay, you may start having some problems with that. Chocolate is high in tyrosine some smoked meats as well. And then there's a medicinal herb and drug interaction. So here's our garlic friend, okay? Garlic and warfarin, the blood thinner. If you have atrial fibrillation, you're taking that. May increase your bleeding side effects. There's a new drug called glipizide for diabetes. It may cause you to drop your blood sugar way too low. If you're taking ginkgo and you are on the seizure medication, uh, phenytoin, you may actually start having seizures again because of reduced levels of the drug. Kava is another herbal that's out there. And if you're taking any kind of sedatives, it will prolong the effect of the sedatives and make it hang around a lot longer. St. John's wort, if you are borderline iron deficient anemia, it'll worsen that. And if you take this herbal, valerian, and you get an anesthetic, you're going to be hanging around a lot longer. So, as we age, things start winding down a little bit, okay? Our body water decreases, our fat increases, and medications tend to go either dissolved in the water or they dissolve into your fat. So if they dissolve in the water and our water decreases, you're going to have higher concentrations of the drug. And similarly, if it dissolves in the fat and we have more fat, they are going to have lower concentrations of the drug. Our kidneys, over time, especially if you have hypertension, hypertension trashes the kidneys, okay? The little glomeruli, 
they don't like operating under a high pressure system. And so if you have untreated hypertension, you're slowly trashing your kidneys and your ability to metabolize those drugs begins to drop. Your liver, as you age, begins to slow down. It can't metabolize as well. And so the same principle applies in pediatrics where kids are developing. We have to be careful about how much medication we give them. And as we begin to age, we have to be careful of the kinds of medication that we give you because your metabolism is changing as you get older. And shock and surprise, older people have more medical conditions and they take more medications. So they're more prone to have drug interactions. And there are very few studies that have done to look at proper dosing in people as they age. So, myth or fact? If it's over the counter, it must be safe to fly with. How many agree? Okay, all right, so I'm communicating. I'm making, okay, my pilot knows I'm a doctor. He would not give me any drug that I'm not safe to fly with. Yes, no? Okay. I've been taking this medication for years without side effects. I don't need to worry about it. Well, there's the aging piece, okay? You're not the same as you were last year, as you were five years ago. And so your metabolism starts the same, but you're taking the same dose of drug. So you may have some problems down the road. All right, here's our friend diphenhydramine, otherwise known as Benadryl. Okay, which of the following over-the-counter drugs uh, is, is true about this drug? It's used in many cold medications? Yes, no? Yeah, okay. It's used in sleeping medications? Hello. It's the most common over-the-counter drug in fatal crashes. About 10% of our fatals, diphenhydramine's on there. Air traffic controllers can't do safety sensitive duties for 60 hours after a single dose of Benadryl. True, okay? So the correct answer is all of the above. So here's our friend uh, Benadryl, and it's used for all these different conditions. All right? And this is just a handful of the 65 over-the-counter drugs that all have Benadryl in it, okay? Theraflu, nighttime, severe cold, Sudafed sinus nighttime, Alahist, Diphenmax, Actifed allergy, Benefed plus, it just goes on. So you gotta read the labels. You gotta know what you're taking. So here's an airman who was 70 years old, about 300 hours flying a beach and uh, taking off in night instrument conditions. Well, first of all, you gotta wonder about that. You know, <clears throat> if you're not instrument rated and you're taking off in night instrument, that's adding a lot of challenge. On his medical exam, he reported he was taking aspirin. At the accident site, the FAA does toxicology, and they send tox samples, and we scan the entire spectrum of medication, both over-the-counter as well as prescription. And he was on diphenhydramine. Now, this drug in older people is a bad drug. It really has horrible side effects. We had an airman who was flying into DuPage about this age, and he was uh, having some allergy symptoms, and so his wife gave him uh, 50 milligrams of Benadryl. And then, just before the flight, he took another 50 just to be on the safe side. So he's flying along, and then all of a sudden, boom, he lands on the runway, and he kind of wakes up, and he's like, whoa, where am I? How did I get here? And he was flying in this fog. So he goes in to see his AME, doesn't say anything gets his medical certificate as he gets his exam completed, and he does one of the classic hey docs as he's walking out the door. And he says, uh, hey doc, you know, I had this thing happen uh, a couple weeks ago at, as I was flying, and I, I don't remember anything until boom, I hit the runway, and suddenly I woke up and I kind of knew where I was. And uh, do you think that's anything important? Um, <clears throat> fortunately, his wife was there. He says, honey, you know, you." you were taking some Benadryl. You think that might have had something to do with it? <clears throat> so Benadryl in old people really puts them in a fog. My mother-in-law came to visit us in Germany and she was having an allergic reaction to a medication. And she was 78 years old, took some Benadryl. And she was having to take it for the hives, so she took it for several days. She absolutely does not remember anything about her trip to Europe. Ma, here you are in front of the Eiffel Tower. Ma, here you are in front of the Arc de Triomphe. 
I was there. I mean, total fog. So you really, really want to be careful with this drug. It fogs you in a way that you don't even know that you're being fogged. So there's a, a list of drugs that you shouldn't use in people that are 65 or older. And it's called the beers list, OK? And it's available free. You can download it. You can read it. It's a little technical because it has generic as well as prescription uh, 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 names. But it will show you what drugs you probably should not be taking if you're over 65 because the side effects are so great. And here you can see diphenhydramine is on that list. And it says risk of confusion, all right? And uh, should not be used. And it's a strong recommendation. The evidence is fairly moderate that don't use this drug unless you absolutely have to for some kind of allergic reaction and there is no other drug. So you really want to be careful with that. Our friend Tylenol, <coughs> leading cause for liver transplantation in the United States. OK, who'd have thunk? All right, as little as seven and a half grams of Tylenol is enough to permanently trash your liver, put you in a hepatic coma, and be on the waiting list, OK? So this is where we talked about those additive drugs. You know, you don't realize that it's in this, and it's in another drug, and you're taking this. And a lot of people feel that if two tablets are good, four tablets are better, OK? Now, there's a reason that we have limits on the dosing. You don't know what your liver can handle. You don't know what your kidneys can handle. So don't be very, very careful with that. Some countries actually restrict the sale, the amount of Tylenol that you can buy to help prevent people from overdosing as well as suicide. So a good rule of thumb, if a drug says that it has sedation, is use five dosing intervals, OK? I mean, put your five fingers up, OK? Five dosing intervals. All right, if it says take every 12 hours, 5 times 12 is 60. All right, that'd be 60 hours, 2.5 days before it's safe to fly. If it says take one every 24 hours, now we're talking five days, OK? This works for most people. It's not perfect science, but it, it's good enough, all right? And it does not apply to drugs that are on the no-fly list, OK? You should not fly at all if you're taking those drugs. So where do I go to get information? Jeez, you know, there's a lot of technical stuff here. They use big words, et cetera. So you can talk to your AME. You can talk to us in the regional office and actually talk to a doc, all right? So we're available. You can Google the, uh, the medication. You can also Google the uh, AME guide. There is a medication list. So if you go to the FAA webpage, and as you go down towards the bottom, there's a thing that says pharmaceuticals. And you look at that, and it gives you, right there in the center, pharmaceuticals. And it gives you information about those drugs. And you can scroll down and look at different types of drugs. And you can also look at the do not issue, do not fly on these drugs to see if you're taking any of those. And the do not fly drugs basically do bad things to you. So, and you may not be aware that these bad things are happening to you. And there's a reason why we don't want you to fly on those. And then these are the categories as you can scroll down and read about drugs for uh, uh, anticholinergics, drugs used for Parkinson, et cetera, diabetic medications malaria, psychiatric drugs, seizure drugs. But the NIH, the National Library of Medicine, has a very nice website that you can go to as well. And this also has the herbals and over-the-counters. So you can click on this and read about uh, those medications as well as herbal supplements and some of the drug interactions. So uh, that's a nice resource as well. And the FAA just put out a very nice uh, safety briefing on this particular topic that you can uh, also download and review. And so now, when you're doing the I'm safe checklist, you're more informed, and you know exactly whether you're safe to fly. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, wait for the microphone, if you could. We'll have a mic come to you right here. Now, you don't need to give me your personal medical history and all that kind of stuff. 
If you want to talk personal medical stuff, come right around behind us. We have a team of doctors available that will be happy to talk about your friend who has this medical condition who's taking this. <laughs> so go ahead. Pro probiotics? Yeah. So I would uh, I'd go online and, and look at that and just see if there's any interaction for that particular drug. I, I'm not a compendium. I'm not a pharmacologist. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So when you're flying across country and you get the sniffles, what should you take? You're flying across the country, you get the sniffles. All right. So you need to be aware that Flying with a cold is probably not a good idea because it can set you up to have a sinus block or ear block. And those aren't fun to have at altitude. So you really need to make sure how sick or sniffly you are. One drug that we use that doesn't cause sedation is Sudafed. All right. And Sudafed by itself, okay, because it comes in lots of combinations, is a safe drug for decongestion. And afrin is another good thing to carry, afrin nasal spray, oxymetazolin. And we always encourage our fighter pilots to carry it in their G-suit pocket. So if they got a sinus block or an ear block at altitude, you spray it in, wait a few minutes, spray it in again. That gets it all the way back to the eustachian tube so that you'll be able to clear the sinus or the ear. And of course, go back to the altitude before you come back down and do it a lot more slowly. So, do that aspirin and aspirin? No, not aspirin, afrin, A-F-R-I-N. Right. Is there an aspirin type product? You said that there's problems with the Tylenol. You're something aches, hurts. Your knee hurts? Well, Tylenol, Motrin, those are okay drugs if you stay within the dosing intervals for your age and, uh, uh, and also the, uh, you need to read the label that you're not doing duplicate. In other words, this medication also contains Motrin or Tylenol. So that's the key. If you're taking a cold medication and you're taking a pain medication, many times those will duplicate. Question here for you, Dr. Shaw. Yes. I, I noticed with interest uh, under anti-malarials, there's mefloquine. Yeah. This is a really dangerous drug, and I'm surprised to see it up there. Um, like I don't think anybody yeah. should be Yeah, so if you go anymore. to the FAA website, they talk about those specific things, the concerns that the various drugs that you're taking and which ones would probably be better to take. Yep. Yeah, they are, there's some weird stuff that has happened with mefloquine. One other one up here. Okay. So going back to the like if you're like if you have the sniffles in the cockpit, so like I'm pretty regular with allergies and so uh I usually take like stuff like Claritin or Zyrtec or uh Okay, Mucinex. so Claritin so, or Allegra would be the better one. Zyrtec actually does have some sedation, so we don't recommend that you take Zyrtec. Okay. So Claritin over anything else. Claritin's usually. fine, but again, Claritin comes with other drugs added to it. So you can get Claritin Plus, you can get Claritin, you know, cold, whatever. So make sure you know exactly what you're taking. Oh, hey, thank you. Sure. Um, Go ahead. Is it okay? Go ahead. Yeah. So my question is a, Go ahead. You're fine. Keep going. Okay. My question is about um, not the sedation, but for some reason for me, I have seasonal allergies. I can't take the Claritin and the uh -huh. because it causes me to be anxious and jittery. Okay. So the question is she has allergies and the two medications that she takes makes, makes her jittery, etc. There are actually six classes of antihistamines out there. that, uh, And so we have people who specialize in otolaryngic allergy. That's what they do. So I would see someone and have them work with you, and they can figure out a medication that would uh, be acceptable for you. Are they here? Uh, no, we, you need to go see your clinician or your ENT doctor, and they can help you find a drug that will work for you. And, uh, and also maybe do uh, immunotherapy or sublingual therapy to manage your allergies so you don't even have to take medication. Question over here, yes. doctor. Question on the Claritin. I thought there was a six-hour limit after you took it before you could fly. 
So the question was Claritin, the six hour limit. Before you take any drug new, okay, you've never taken it before, we normally like you to ground test for at least a day so that you know that you don't have any side effects from that medication. But once you've taken it and you don't have any side effects, then you're good to go. You don't have to do the six hour wait. All right, I'll, I'll come over to you here so we get the mic. Maybe it doesn't squeal. I have my tennis shoes on. Move fast. If you fill out your biannual meds to FAA and email it in, if there's anything on there that shouldn't be on there, will they get back to you? They normally do. I'd like to say... Your AME is responsible for looking at those medications and determining if there's a disqualifying medication. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And if there are no other flags on the exam, it may just go to file and nobody sees it. But a good portion of the exams are reviewed by an analyst, either in Oklahoma City or in the regions. And as they look at the medications, they see you're on a disqualifying medication, then they'll send you a letter and say, hey, uh, this medication is unacceptable, and so please uh, do something about it. So, Dr. Shaw, next question's here. Sorry, me again. Um, okay. So I'm starting out flying as a student pilot, and I've been um, – motion sickness has got me a little bit more than I thought I would. W what do you recommend? Because I have those little bands that you put on your wrists, easy on, easy off. Uh, okay. What do you recommend to, I guess – Counter sure. So effect. the question is motion sickness with flying. So flying is an unusual environment where our cochlear vestibular system is not used to being, just like in space. And most of the time, it just takes flying hours. Okay. Back in the day when I was a young flight student in a C-130 training base, the load masters in the back of the cargo area of the C-130 didn't have any windows to look out and it was a hot Arkansas countryside and they were bouncing around all over and they would just get sick as dogs and they'd be barfing their brains out and they think, you know, my life as a loadmaster is, is over, I'm never going to be able to do this. And so what we would do with them is we'd give them 30 milligrams of ephedrine and 30 milligrams of uh, ephedrine and or 25 and that would actually uh, sedate them enough to fly once with an instructor to make sure that, look, you can fly without getting sick. And then we would gradually wean them off that. And as they built hours, and generally it took about 30 hours for them to kind of get their flight legs and, and habituate that. The other things you can do is you can do things like riding roller coasters or you know, spin somebody, spin you around in the chair. There are a lot of things that you can do to kind of upregulate your vestibular system to uh, get it used to and habituated to those environments. And at, at Brooks, we had what's called a human centrifuge. And the centrifuge would spin you around at different G levels, but it started out with a gondola that was upright. And as it accelerated, it would go into this position horizontally and you were spinning around and then there's a dead man switch that if you had enough fun you could let go of and the centrifuge would suddenly stop and what would happen is that gondola would suddenly drop into the vertical position from horizontal and so you get what we call is cross coupling into your balance organ so you got an input coming in from one direction and an input coming in from another direction and it makes your eyeballs go crazy you get this nystagmus where your eyeballs are bouncing up and down up and down and you just have the sensation that you're tumbling over and over and over again. The more that you ride the centrifuge, the less that you have that symptom. And in fact, you can suppress that nystagmus because of the experience that you have as a rider. Centrifuge? <laughs> Amusement parks, okay? <laughs> so go to uh, Six Flags just down the road here. They got plenty of rides. Okay. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Just a microphone here. Hi. Hi. I think you probably covered it, but what about Advil? That's like aspirin, right? What about what? Advil. Advil? Okay. Advil is what we call is a non-steroidal, like Motrin, okay? And as we talked about, 
The non-steroidals can make you retain sodium. So if you're taking a diuretic where you're trying to get rid of sodium and you're taking a drug that makes you hold on to sodium, they're fighting each other. And, uh, but for most people, it's a safe drug to use. Check with your doctor. Okay, I'll be up here uh, afterwards if you've got any questions, but uh, thank you for your time and attention.